We are an all volunteer organization um, concerned with promoting and exploring in community with others, the ideas of the great depth psychologist, Carl Gustav Jung. As an all volunteer organization, we uh, very much rely on you uh, and our community to help us to meet our financial obligations in bringing you this monthly lecture series. Um, so please consider making a donation tonight to help us cover the costs. Um, we suggest a $10 donation, but anything that you could do would be very much appreciated. I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce to you our board members and to thank them for their work on behalf of the organization. Um, our, the president of our organization is Erica Lorenz. Christine Olson is our secretary. Mark Iwan Iwanicki is our marketing strategist. Penny Tarasuk is our advisor. Ed Tick is our program director. Judy Hall is our treasurer, and uh, I, I handle public relations. Also, many kind thanks to Andy Grant, um, our technical host tonight, for providing uh, Zoom and technical assistance. Andy's generously helped us through the COVID season with our Zoom presentations. Thank you, Andy. Um, next month's lecture will be on Friday, November 5th. At 7 p.m., Pamela Donlevy will present. Uh, Ed, help me with this. Is it Temis? Ed, help me with this. Is it Temis or Themis? Oh, Themis. Yes. Th I'm sorry. I thought you meant the tennis game. No, it's Themis. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Themis. <Okay. laughs> yes. So it's Themis, a healing archetype for our times. I'm not as I'm not as uh, conversant in Greek as our friend Ed is. So that will be November 5th, Pamela Dunlevy, Themis, a healing archetype for our times. So please join us for that. Uh, please uh, also visit our website for our full lecture schedule. Uh, you can reach our website at westmassyoung.org. Also on the website, there are other things to explore, including archives of uh, past lectures and events. So feel free to go there and explore. Um, and now I'm going to pass uh, things over to uh, Ed Tick, and he will introduce us to tonight's speaker. Well, good evening, our friends. Thank you very much for attending tonight and any and all of uh, our programs that you, uh, that you can make. Uh, I am very pleased and honored to introduce my good friend and colleague, Roger Brook. Roger is a warrior, a healer, a scholar, and a teacher. Uh, he really has walked the archetypal uh, path. Uh, he walks the walk as an archetypal pioneer, as a serviceman, as a, and as a servant. And he is a beloved mentor and elder to very many people, not only in this country, but overseas and in his homeland of South Africa as well. I want to give you a brief history of Roger's really interesting and exciting life. We could talk about, about you, Roger, for hours, but we won't. We want to listen to you talk to us for hours. So uh, Roger was born and raised in South Africa. You will hear his delicious accent tonight. Uh, he served as a paratrooper in the South African military. And this, among other things, was a profound and formative uh, uh, experience of his life that he has continued to grow, develop, and build on. Uh, he's also spent much time in, not just in society, but in the wilderness, and especially uh, in the African wild places. Roger has spent his time with the lions and tigers and bears, as well as people. And so he, his topic tonight of place is really relevant because he doesn't only talk about others and Jung's aspect of place and psyche, but he does it. And he needs to do it to restore himself and come back to us with his wisdom. Uh, he did, as I said, he served as a paratrooper in the South African military. And now he is learning to fly. He's becoming a pilot himself. 
and maybe others will jump out of his airplane, but he's not jumping anymore, he's piloting. <laughs> uh, presently, uh, Roger is a distinguished professor of psychology at Duquesne University. He is a Jungian analyst with an active practice. He's also a Jungian training analyst and nurtures the next generations of archetypal healers. Also, in addition, uh, Roger was the founder and the director of the Veteran Clinic at Duquesne University. And I can't speak highly enough about this for any of you who know my work. Uh, I work with veterans. Uh, Roger and I have worked together very much. I need to tell you that Roger has founded and created one of the very best veteran healing centers in the entire country. It is uh, just that Duquesne is one of the few places that teaches Jungian and archetypal psychology at the uh, college and graduate levels. And Rogers Clinic is a, one of the only places that uses the archetypal model in helping our warriors heal. So this is inc critically important. And Roger has done really important work in helping restore the true meaning of the warrior archetype. Uh, Roger also was, uh, we worked together when I was uh, uh, the founding and we directed um, Soldiers Heart, a nonprofit organization to help our veterans. Uh, so we worked together in that effort and Roger was blessedly and voluntarily the chairman of the board for several years of our organization. Roger also has an important book out. Uh, if you're really interested in Jungian psychology and want to really chew it, because this is not an easy book, but it is quite a comprehensive book. Roger's book is called Jung and Phenomenology. It's published by Rutledge and as one of their classics uh, in the psychology field. He's also the author of many articles uh, in archetypal psychology and Jungian psychology and theory uh, in veteran uh, military healing. And I'm going to mention one of his articles. In case any of you are interested, Roger wrote uh, a book chapter called An Archetypal Approach to Treating uh, Combat Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. If you want to learn how to do this uh, in a short course, look up this chapter. It's really incisive and brilliant and it does teach us how to help our wounded warriors penetrate the archetypal dimensions and restore a healthy warrior archetype. So thank you for all of your work, Roger. And I finally, I want to publicly honor you and thank you for all your work, for our splendid partnership and for all the contributions you've made to restoring the warrior archetype to our military and veterans in our world. So Roger, I honor you, I love you, and I give you to our audience. Uh, Ed, you are, you are so kind. Thank you very much. And um, you, you are really very kind. I do have to, just for the record, I do need to make a correction. I'm actually not, I was never formally trained as a Jungian analyst. I'm an honorary member of the Interregional Society of Jungian Analysts. And it is true that I've been teaching at the Jung Institute, training institute here in Pittsburgh now, since I arrived here nearly 30 years ago. But, and uh, I mean, it might be just a technicality. A lot of Jungian analysts regard me as one of their own and so on. But I do like just to honor the fact that I'm not a graduate of an institute. My, my actual, my training, most of my training was, was in much more in the psychoanalytic tradition, but Jung was my first love. <clears throat> uh, screen share. I think I should start off by, I'm going to start off by uh, <clears throat> telling you a dream, talking about psyche and place. Some months ago, I had a dream in which uh, I was in my library. It was a dream library. It was rather long and narrow, and it wasn't my actual architecture. And a baby elephant was kept charging at me. And I climbed up onto my library bookcase to get out of the way. And it was quite playful. He had charged at me, and I'd jump up on this top of this library. And uh, then he'd go away, and I'd get down again. And he'd hear me getting down, and he'd come running back at me. And even though he was a baby and it was playful, a baby elephant is still 500 pounds. Yeah. and could do some damage. And I have an old schizophrenic friend. My old great friend from childhood days suffers from schizophrenia. And 
he's really learned how to just accept things as they are and with, with good cheer. And he was standing there laughing and laughing and laughing and said, oh, you, you, can't, you can't hide hide on top of a bookcase. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and uh, so I decided an active imagination with this dream was, was due. And so I said to uh, this elephant, why do you, you know, who are you and why do you keep charging at me? And the answer was instantaneous. It's because I am your soul. And uh, I then said, so why, so why is my soul coming at me in the form of an elephant? And the answer, again, instantly was because we'll never forget you. And I was hit. It hit me like a punch. Uh, I felt the wind knocked out of me. I gasped for breath. I felt quite tearful. And it's one of the things that has led me to tell my chair just a couple of weeks ago that I'm going to be retiring from Duquesne University at the end of this academic year. I really need to get back into the African bush and uh, spend, spend more time there. So I hope you enjoyed my dream. Play. Here we go. I've got a story to tell. I have a story to tell. We're going to talk about psyche and place. Can you see if, uh, whoopsie, hang on. If I, do you see the whole picture or are my picture, the pictures of you in the way? No, we see it fine. Okay, this picture of by Hieronymus Bosch from 1501. What, what is so striking about this, this great painting is that, that uh, for Hieronymus Bosch, psychological life is all around him. There are little demons and helpers and trees and, and a little chapel and so on. And there's a church in the dist couple of church spires in the distance. Psychological life is all around him. We could say that he is in psychological life. The space around him is not mere geometric space. It is indeed a place uh, which carries history and imagination and carries psyche. <laughs> We see, this, uh, we see this quality of life uh, beautifully portrayed in, pre -Renaissance, in this picture of pre-Renaissance Florence, where if you look at the left-hand side of the picture, you're looking at the city from the left. And if you look at the right-hand side of the picture, you're looking at it from the right. And uh, the, there are two people standing on the sides of the wings of this picture. And of course, they're much bigger than the buildings. And what we see, of course, we now rather say they hadn't yet learned linear perspective. Well, in, in one sense, of course, that's true. But in another sense, this is a, a, this is a world that is not painted or inhabited with the domination of the eye. It rather appeals to all the senses. This is a city that you can feel. It has texture. You can almost hear it and smell it. It is very different from the picture of Florence drawn uh, after the development of linear perspective and the, the, um, <clears throat> and the, the Renaissance. You can see the, this presumably is the, excuse me, is the artist himself, uh, including himself in the picture sitting above Florence. This, is a, this now is a city, it's beautifully done. It's a beautiful city laid out there but it is essentially drawn as a mathematical grid. The place of Florence as a historical, psychological, soulful place is secondary to Florence as a set of mathematical coordinates upon a grid. The person who has discussed this history in some detail is an art historian called Edgerton, whose work was picked up by Robert Ruminition, who has recently retired from the Pacifica Graduate Institute. And my own, excuse me, my own take on this history is very much based uh, and indebted to, to their work, and particularly to Robert Ruminition. Um, when I said here that the, the soul of the city is secondary to Florence as a set of coordinates upon a grid, that's not polemical. That is exactly how it was drawn. 
we see here this uh, this uh, drawing for, or wood carving from woodcut from 1531, where we see a diagram of how to draw a landscape. And what you do is you set a you set a set of coordinates like a grid on the window. And then you have a same set of coordinates on a grid overlooking on your sheet of paper. And then what the artist is doing is he is tracing what he sees in two dimensions on the coordinates there on the window. He's not looking through the window into a, into a landscape. He is looking quite literally at a set of coordinates upon a two dimensional grid, which he is now copying um, onto, his own, uh, onto his own paper. That's how we draw with, math with uh, linear perspective, where space becomes an issue to do with mathematics. <clears throat> Before I carry on here, I want to just quit this for a moment and read something to you. Let's see. Sorry, we try again. There we go. Um, there is quite a remarkable. I wrote an I wrote an essay on on called Jung's Recollection of the World uh, some years ago. There it is, Jung's Recollection of the World. Um, I want to just quote with from you for you this uh, some lines from Galileo, uh, as obviously as translated. Galileo, who was who's uh, mathematics was so formative in the development of our scientific world, wrote a project for science in which he says, I think you can read with me, empirical observation forms the primary criterion for truth. Only the scientific method of disc and discourse are appropriate to the world of things. Only the mathematical, physical properties of things of primary, in other words, present in the things, you know, that's an extraordinary thing to say. If we want to speak objectively about something, all we can speak is mathematics, which includes, say, physics and chemistry, etc. later. All other qualities, meanings, or values are what Galileo called secondary and subjective. And for Galileo, sensuous experience, that is to say, the world, the world that we inhabit and experience, a world of meanings and values and hopes and fears and gods and temptations and so on and so on. All that sensuous experience is illusory. This was quite a crisis for how we saw the world. And as you might remember, Descartes then solved the problem by, uh, by saying, well, uh, the world, the external world, we can leave to Galilean mathematics and uh, experience becomes uh, really a matter of mind. So I don't see you folks on you folks over here on my screen now. What I do, all I can say is that I have a mental image of you. And we see this kind of Cartesian uh, perspective on the world in which the world becomes pure mathematics and all psychological life becomes behind the eyes and between the ears. Uh, we see that running through psychoanalytic theory and uh, cognitive psychology and so on. Um, so here we go. Let me go place this play again. So let's move on. We see we this was the world, by the way, of the young psychiatrist Jung. Uh, working at the Bergholtzi Hospital as a good empirical, young empirical scientist. <clears throat> Where he writes, it is my mind with its store of images that gives the world color and sound and that supremely, what does it say? I can't see it here because, <laughs> da -da, there we go. And that supremely real and rational certainty, which I call experience, notice the scare quotes, is in its most simple form an exceedingly complicated structure of mental images. There is in a certain sense, nothing that is directly experienced except the mind itself. There we go. There's a, a, a travel mug from something called red bubble. There's Jung's model of mind all going on inside the head. 
you see you've got the self in there and the shadow and conscious and unconscious and so on. The psyche in this model of in this understanding, the psyche is behind the eyes and between the ears. I thought you'd enjoy that. <clears throat> but da -da, there is another Jung, his number two personality, as we all know. There we are. This was the Jung who lived at Bollingen. And there he is in his house. This is not a Jung whose psychological life is lived behind his eyeballs and between his ears. And with that introduction, I want to tell you a story. This photograph was taken actually exactly at the time the story happened. It was in the winter. This is, this is a, a South African winter in the Umfalozi Basin. It's about uh, 30 miles or so from the Indian Ocean, not very far south of Mozambique. So even on a, a winter morning, it is short pants and T-shirts and so on. Makubu Ntombela was a guide who had been working. How's this? He had been working in the Umfalozi since 1914. His uh, partner was Ian Player, by the way, who was the golfer Gary Player's older brother. And Ian Player started working in the Umfalozi Basin as a ranger uh, in, the in the 1950s. And he and Makubu had been working there ever, ever, from the 1950s onwards. And the story is this. We, I, I went into the wilderness. In fact, I wrote an essay on Jung's experience in Africa and the birth of consciousness, which I first presented around a firelight at this uh, little gathering. There were six of us and these two rangers. Uh, and I read it at a firelight. And in fact, at one point, the hyenas running around the camp were making such a racket that I, I wasn't able to read my paper uh, because of the noise. And I had to wait until they sort of, they passed and moved on. And, and then I was able to read my paper. In any event, that first night that we were in this Umfalozi wilderness, which is a big game country, lion, elephant, <clears throat> um, hyena, rhino, hippo, leopard, buffalo, the whole works, crocodiles in the rivers. Um, this, was, this was the heart of the, the uh, African wilderness in the Umfalozi Basin. Anyway, that first night, I was very disappointed to realize that we were not as in the heart of the wilderness as I had thought, uh, because I woke at about midnight, and under the starlight, I could see about a half a mile to a mile east of us, there was a high ridge, and I could, there was very clearly a village up there. I couldn't see anything, but I could hear the sounds of celebrations going on on this ridge. The, uh, you could hear cowbells occasionally and drums and laughter and, and so on. And I wondered, <clears throat> after I got over my disappointment, I then wondered what the celebrations were this late at night. And I, was it a successful childbirth or somebody's recovery from illness or a marriage? Or maybe sometimes it just might be the welcome of a stranger or a, an honored guest of some kind. <clears throat> After about 15 minutes, I, uh, I could see my companion. We used to stand guard through the night, taking two-hour stints and keep a, coffee, a little ke kettle of coffee going and walk around the fire and keep it going and so on. And that would keep the wildlife, make it, keep it safe. I thought, you know, it wouldn't be safe if you didn't keep a guard standing uh, through the night. And we took turns. I could see my companion there, and I assumed my companion was listening to the sounds the same as I was. In any event, in the morning when this photograph was taken, uh, I didn't think much of it, but I happened to mention that I hadn't realized where we were because there was this, uh, <coughs> this celebration going on on the ridge. Uh, Ian Player said something in Zulu to Makubu, who, who could not speak English. And Makubu looked really interested and asked me something in turn. And we went back and forth in translation. And I could hear that something very intense was going on between them. 
um, and quite and Mutkubu seemed quite excited. Uh, and finally, they said what had happened. Uh, nobody had lived on that ridge for a hundred years, but it is. But that ridge, excuse me. Why can't I get this thing done? Uh, why can't I? Ah, anyway, sorry about that. Um, nobody had lived on that ridge for a hundred years, but it was where his father had lived. And his father had made the spears on that ridge that had killed, that had slaughtered a thousand British soldiers nearby at Isanjwana in 1879. And those British soldiers would have been wearing Brook family wool because my family produced all the wool for the British army through the whole rise of the British Empire. And it took a while for me to realize what had happened and the, the enormity of the, the numinosity of the moment, I would actually say probably only really grabbed me over the weeks and months and even years afterwards, I still feel quite awed by this extraordinary experience that somehow through Makubu, who was, who was a Zulu uh, diviner and uh, shaman. Um, um, that somehow I had been welcomed as a son and grandson of British colonialists. I had been welcomed into this heart of the Zulu wilderness. The Umfalozi Basin was, in fact, Chaka, King Chaka's personal hunting ground. And so we were as deep in Zulu wilderness and history as we could possibly be. And, of course, Makubu had spent his whole life in that basin. Um, so it was an extraordinary moment of homecoming. And I've, I've written an essay about it, which I have put on the little sort of syllabus for folks if they're interested. It's an experience of homecoming. And for me, uh, being a, somehow allowed to be a white South African and deeply welcomed into the continent instead of feeling a little bit like a, a sort of a foreigner in my own homeland. I just thought I'd show you this photograph. This is also that, uh, it's not this, this is many years later, also in the Umfalozi with my son. We'd, we had been sleeping on where the camera was taken and photograph was taken. And we've actually, we saw a lion. We saw a male lion walking along there a, a, an hour or so earlier. We made sure he was well out of sight before we walked across the river. The river there is only ankle deep, so it's quite safe. It was, it's great in, out there in the wilderness. Yeah, I took that picture. It was, I often think that the, the presence has this very strange way of emerging if you're quiet. And uh, I actually have this photograph on my professional website, which says that healing often appears rather surprisingly and unexpectedly if we just keep quiet. It appears as mysteriously as this elephant out of the grass. In fact, in the minutes after that, there was a whole herd of elephants that appeared out of that long grass. <coughs> but of course, we don't have to go to the Umfalozi Basin. This is in Frick Park, just a couple of hundred yards from my house in Pittsburgh for both wilderness and place. There it is in a very different kind of psychological place. Dormant, frozen, as you folks in Western Massachusetts know, winter, all the seasons have their own psychological life and they, they make their claim on us in different ways. Okay. All right, I've told you the first story. I thought I'd tell you another story. This is a, a story of a really remarkable Koza woman who, who uh, grew up on the Hogsback Mountains in the Eastern Cape and who was a very humble woman. She was illiterate. She, couldn't, uh, she could not even write her own name. So I like this photograph of her and her son who's graduating from college with a business degree. She was a she was a really remarkable 
uh, person in all sorts of ways. And I have to be able to read this. Let me open this up. Okay, I can't do it. I'll just have to remember. It's fine. I can remember it. Okay. She was feeling fairly troubled. And so she told me uh, her dream. Oh, here it is. It'll come. There we go. This is her dream. And she told me her dream, which I listened to with, with great humility because uh, of our cultural difference. But she knew that I was a person who worked with dreams. And so this was the dream she told me. I'm on the farm where I was raised, which was, by the way, about 5,000 feet up in the mountains, uh, just inland from the Indian Ocean. It's very rugged and beautiful country. The land has been in my family since before my great grandfather. Someone is driving a tractor, pulling a plow over the land where we farm cattle and buried our ancestors. I am worried and upset. Then I go down a pathway to a small pond. I walk into the water up to my chest. It was very peaceful. I see lots of little golden fishes in the water around me, and I'm so happy to see them. Some of them come to the surface and they speak to me. They say that I must not worry or be sad and that they will look after me. And then I get out of the water. One of the things that I so love, I've always loved about Jung's psychology is it is the only psychology I think that it, only, the, the only psychology, and that's especially true in the psychoanalytic field, that, that tries genuinely and systematically to be a cross-cultural or trans-cultural psychology. His archetypal theory is explicitly an attempt to reach beyond the parochialism he saw in Freud's psychoanalysis as a Victorian bourgeois perspective on the world to something that could be uh, radically empirical in a, and that is his, so his, all his cross-cultural studies, his alchemical studies are all in the search of an empirical ground that reaches beyond the confines of his own European 19th century and early 20th century West, you know, culture. So Jung, I think, I'm sure that even though you've never been to Africa, you know nothing of her associ personal associations. Probably most of you, if not all of you, have some sense that we are in the presence here of something that is quite profound. And not only, of course, that she would entrust me with her dream, but that she would share with me a dream that reaches deep into the landscape of her ancestral history. There's a tractor plowing this land. The modern world is taking over this ancestral landscape. Those of you who think of Goethe's Faust might think of the Faustian project of reclaiming the land under the sea from whom the gods Philemon and Borcus fled they fled before the onslaught of the Faustian project. It's in that context that Jung's uh, sign over the gateway to Bollingen, Faust's atonement, Philemon's sanctuary has such meaning. That sign, Philemon's sanctuary and Faust's atonement, is relevant. It is reflected, I think, in this woman's dream as she herself is transitioning or is in the transition between cultures, her own traditional landscape, and then the, the tractor as the epistemology, if you like, of the modern world. That is to say, the way we organize knowledge, that landscapes are there to be used, they're economic, they're measured in terms of economic value rather than ancestral meaning, and so on. And of course, her son then graduates from college with a business degree. So this dream is poised in cultural transition. And she walks up to her chest in this water 
which is a kind of baptism in her own culture too. And all these little golden fishes, I will say there are no golden fishes in those rivers. So these, <coughs> these golden fishes, I did do my homework, by the way. Um, I'm not making this up. Uh, <laughs> these golden fishes, therefore, are recognized by her and by a Kosa uh, uh, anthropologist that I knew. These are spiritual fishes. They are symbolic fishes. And I said to her, she was so happy to see them. And they come to the surface and they speak to her. And I told her that I said, I thought that those fishes were the way in which her ancestors were coming to her. And she started to cry and said she had thought that they might be the ancestors, but that she was too shy to think that the ancestors would speak to her. And I said, no, I think they are speaking to you. And uh, they are very reassuring. And of course, they reassured her that she was able to live a life uh, in, in the city and with its economic benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So once again, this dream, which is so profoundly transformative, is also embed embeds her and all of us who bear witness to this dream in a landscape. How are we doing? Should I tell you one more? I'm going to tell you one more. I'll tell you one more. This is a short one. When I was at Rhodes University in South Africa, which was in the Eastern Cape in the hills just off the Indian Ocean, we had a Kosa graduate student who was expressed his frustration with Jung. And it was that that uh, Jung would say that something was symbolic. And, but by calling it symbolic, this Kosa student felt that it was disrespectful to the reality of the bee or the, of the, the thing that was symbolic. And we talked about the example of a bee, where Jung would say that uh, the, bee, the bee is not merely a biological specimen, the, the object of science, in other words, going all the way back to mathematics. It's not merely a specimen. The bee is also symbolic, and it symbolizes the ancestors in traditional Kosa culture. So when a bee appears, <clears throat> when a bee appears, that symbolizes the presence of the ancestors for the closer student. Now, the thing that was frustrating for this closer student is that the symbolization becomes a matter of mind. It's like, we all know that a bee is really just an, uh, a bug that makes honey. But in the mind of the closer people, it is symbolic. And hence, we can think of synchronicity as the sort of a, a correspondence between an empirical event and an internal psychological or mental meaning. And that's what was frustrating because there is a kind of epistemological, what I have called epistemological colonialism when Jung talks like this. The colonialism is the, is the patronizing sense that we all know there are not real ancestors. These ancestors are really matters of mind you know, uh, or symbols or images in the minds of the Kosa people. Uh, now, there is another way to read Jung, of course, which is that for Jung, the Jung of Bollingen uh, was actually much closer to the Kosa student than he was to some of his own sort of Cartesian and awkward theorizing. Anyway, as this Kosa student and I were talking, a bee flew in the window. Yes, it really did. And it was a wonderful moment of synchronicity. And he asked me to be silent. In fact, he didn't need to ask. I was. I was silent. And we were silent as the ancestors became present to us, right as we were talking about the symbol of the bee. Um, I think that Jung struggles between recognizing the symbolic, he, want, he wants to recognize the symbolic weight and meaningfulness of the bee 
on its own terms. But he does get caught up in some of his theorizing in the Jung of Galileo and Descartes and the, his number one personality and uh, the external world is reducible to mathematics. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> All right, where do, the, where do these stories take us? I'm gonna just be really brief here and, and say that I think that recognizing that, that psychological, that, that we are in psychological life rather than psychological life being in us as a kind of mental state uh, is perhaps the, the, the most significant theoretical contribution that I've made to the field, if, I, if I've made one, I would say that it is this separating mind and psyche. They are often translated by RFC Hull as synonyms and maybe, you know, Jung's Germany seems to use them interchangeably. But I do think it's very helpful for us to separate mind, which is kind of what we think of as mind and psyche. You might remember a quote, a lines at the beginning of his commentary on the secret of the golden flower, where he says something to the effect that perhaps there are some fish that think the sea is inside them or something, but the, the psyche is no more inside us than uh, the sea is inside the fish. In other words, we are in the psyche in the same way that the fish is in the sea. It surrounds us, it carries us. And the, the theoretical implications are quite significant, but I'm gonna just pick up one. And it is to reconfigure the concept of individuation from being something that is, is sometimes rather introverted and interior, as though it's all a kind of an interior mental process or something. Um, the, the Tosa and Zulu concept notion of Ubuntu invites us to think of individuation radically differently. Whereas in Descartes, we, the, Descartes, the Cartesian expression of human is, I think, therefore I am. For the sub-Saharan Black Africans, it is, we are, therefore I am. Our social embeddedness, our existential embeddedness in history and community and place is, what, is that gathering out of which we become the persons that we are. As you can hear, even our, because you're listening to me, even our accents, that is to say, even the musculature and the, of the movement of your muscles and lips and tongue, even the physiology of the face is gathered up and takes its shape through this, uh, through place. So individuation involves the ever widening and deepening of our relationships with others, from our immediate caregivers to the family and wider community, reaching out in self-awareness to the faces of the other, <coughs> excuse me, the other, to the ancestors we carry, to God, if so called, to our non-human animal cousins, and to our blue planet. So to go all the way back to the beginning, when we intersect space, we think of space as geometric space, but when, when space is intersected with time, it becomes a gathering of history and space becomes place. And once space is place, it is the place of our psychological lives and of our individuation. Thank you. I can't hear anybody. Okay, we'll open the room. Donations, donations. Okay, so I, I, there are no chats for me. All right, so people can speak.
When space becomes place, it gathers history and our psychological lives and becomes the place of our individuation. So I hope that made sense to you. I hope you enjoyed the journey. Thank you so much. Um, hello from Melbourne, Australia, Saturday morning, and, and thank you to the Society. And Hi. Yeah, hi. And yeah, wonderful talk. And I, I loved your dream at the start so much. And I wondered, <laughs> in, in climbing the bookshelves, were, did that link to the university to you or more to your sort of your written work or did it have many faceted sort of symbols for you or...? Oh, those are, those are all great associations, and I think they're all true. <laughs> uh, you know, I, it, all, my, all my, my love of an academic and my academic life uh, can't protect me from this <laughs> calling, you know, from the landscape. And, mm. you know, in a way, to think of it, it in terms of the talk, there's a temptation to say, well, what about just understanding the elephant purely symbolically so that you can continue to go to the university every day and somehow there's an inner elephant that I'm somehow meant to have, I don't know, play with or something. No, man, I can't, I don't have an inner elephant. The elephant <laughs> is back. <laughs> Do you know, there's something, there is something monstrous yeah. about the sort and self-absorbed about the idea that that I can just carry on my life exactly as it is and let everything be just sort of some interior symbolic working. Um, mm. You know, I've, that's like being a prisoner sort of meditating to be pretend he's free. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's fantastic. Thank so. you. <laughs> Ed. Roger, I'd like to follow that observation up. <laughs> Could you comment, please, on, well, we all know how desperately hungry, soul-starved most of us are, and how popular it is now for people to seek their spirit guides and to experience them as an inner presence. So do you have uh, guidance and suggestions for when someone discovers the inner elephant? or whatever the creature is, oh, man. how do we help them uh, release themselves from the prison of their own individuality and connect to, well, we can send them to the, into the bush to commune with the real elements, but uh, elephants. But in addition to that, what uh, guidance do you have for break, helping people break out of their individuality and there's solipsism in working with spiritual imagery. No, it's breaking out of the solipsism. It's you know that's the that's the better word that I think you found. It's about breaking out of solipsism. Yeah, your question's a really good one, and make, gives more nuance to the conversation we've just been having, because uh, let me say something at a theoretical level, very quick, very quickly. It come, Jung called himself a phenomenologist, by which he means consistent with the tradition of known as phenomenology, which means that you must take phenomena on their own terms instead of trying to psychoanalyze them away into something else. So uh, the, the image of... Um, let's say the image of the village on that ridge with the celebrations on the ridge to go back to my story or the image of the goldfish in uh, the Koza woman's dream. Um, let's take the, let me take one at a time. The image of the, the village on the ridge, Jung wants us, as a phenomenologist, Jung wants us to say, we need to understand the meaning of that experience without feeling a compulsion to get into what he calls metaphysics and say, well, therefore you believe in ghosts or therefore, or something like that. We don't have to become what he would call ontologists. We don't have to assert metaphysical statements. Let's just stay with the psyche. In the, in the realm of the psyche, this was a real experience and let's just work on, on what it means. The, that's, that's absolutely right. 
The problem with that is simply in the way we understand that, because we usually then drift towards saying, oh, in other words, it's not real. It's just an experience, which means it's in my head. And we want to say, no, don't let's go in that direction either. Let it just be an experience out there where it was, which was on a dark night on a ridge half a mile away as that is gathered in my imagination and psychic life. So he's really, I think he's incredibly subtle and nuanced there. And his notion of psyche is so misunderstood by his critics because he is trying to find a way to say that, that the experience of those people on the ridge, the party, the celebrations on the ridge was psychological, but without making it a matter of mind. So it's inner in the sense that it was certainly my, my, it was given to me, but it wasn't given to anybody else. Nobody else heard it that night. So we, it, it was certainly mine, but that doesn't mean that it was sort of solipsistic and just about me. And the Cosa Woman's dream, those golden fishes, those golden fishes were the way in which her ancestors spoke to her. And I think Jung wants us to say, that they are speaking to her, he would say that is in the psyche because he doesn't want to get into being accused of, I don't know, ancestor worship or all the other sort of metaphysic, what he would call metaphysical nonsense that is speculative and not empirical. And you, you, we don't know what we're talking about. Rather, it's in the psyche, which means, <coughs> which means that it, it's in it's in the world of her place and her as that is gathered in her imagination and in her history. Um, so it's in the psyche in that sense, but it's not that doesn't don't make the other mistake of saying, well, therefore, it's solipsistic and merely a matter of going on in her mind. So the guardian ain't those those golden fishes as guardian angels, I would say, can stay with her as very intimate presences they were able to reassure her. They spoke to her. She felt encouraged. She felt less guilt for leaving those ancestral grounds and coming to the city where she could earn a better living and get her son to school. Um, she was able to feel that this, was, that this movement into the town had the blessing of the ancestors. I think Jung, at his best, is just wonderful at, at asking us just to accept that. So it is deeply psychological, but... Don't slide psyche into solipsism. Have I answered that adequately, Ed? You have to unmute, Ed. Great, thank you. Um, thank you, Roger. I'm going to follow that up. Uh, would you, this gives me chills. Uh, would you say then that a more accurate way of describing your experience in the bush was not I had a vision, but rather I was permitted into the psyche of the place. Yeah. Yeah. And I like the way you said that. That is what I was trying to sort of say that I was, I did realize how deeply honored I was that I was, I was invited into that place and welcomed into that place. I remember I had the rather preposterous thought, I mean, the previous night I'd had this thought, you know, maybe there's an honored guest. I had no idea that the honored guest might be me. That only occurred to me, you know, months or even years later. Um, I mean, I know that they have celebrations when there's an honored guest. Uh, I had no idea that it was me. So I did feel, yeah, I was welcomed into that place. As a son of a whole lot of slaughtered, oh, great, great grandson of a whole lot of slaughtered British soldiers. 1879, by the way, I often think it's pretty close to your, uh, you know what I'm getting at, um, Little Bighorn. Yeah. <laughs> I saw another hand. So I like the way you said that. I think that's exactly right. And Ed, I think that's consistent with Jung, depending on how you read him. And I think that that's what my book tries to do very systematically. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Roger. Yeah. Are you talking? Okay. Yeah. Um, I. Hi, when I, you know, Peter Kingsley's Catafalque, right? I think that's how you pronounce it, is his book written not too long ago. 
Nope. And Anne Baring turned me on to it. But anyway, in that book, it's very clear that Jung was in uh, his place in Bollingen and that he was, that's where he experienced the deepest part of himself. It was, I think, in on the mantle, Jung wrote something about this is my, um, this was his uh, entrance to the underworld. Yeah. That's, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So that's why I had those pictures of Jung at Bollingen, you know, at the beginning, because there he could be inside his psychological life authentically. Mm -hmm. He could be in psychological life in the way that is more, much more difficult under the neon lights in a psychiatrist lab. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's what he became more and more and more. I mean, when he started studying alchemy, he was way past just being a... Um, uh, being a Western psychiatrist. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I think also, because I work with, I, I'm working with the, the uh, body in Jungian work. And that's, this is what subtle body is. I mean, we have to, it's hard to put this stuff into language. It doesn't work very well. Oh, but, I think, it, I think we can, but we, we do need a vocabulary for it. Um, and I think it's, his term of subtle body, which is, of course, from the Sufi term of, of that, I think speaks to this. this. Yeah, there's a, it's really interesting, actually, you could go back to Jung's word association studies. I think uh, there's, a, there's a kind of, here's an interesting piece of history for, for you, which you might, folks might enjoy talking about the body. I hope that's not too much off track, but it'll be short. Uh, Freud was the neurologist who was studying the neurological pathways of hysterics who had all sorts of strange symptoms in the late 19th century. And in the 1896, he tried to, to, he wrote a book called The Project for a Scientific Psychology, in which he tried to situate repression and the defenses between the synapse endings, etc. So he tried to develop a neurological basis for psychoanalysis but it fell apart and he wrote to his friend Fleece that his neurology had failed and that all he had left was his psychoanalysis. So Freud starts as a neurologist of the body and what he discovers is that the body is really the embodiment of language, meaning, uh, and a dynamic cultural history. Jung starts at the other side of the Cartesian mind-body divide. Jung started off by doing experiments on the associations of consciousness. And he became particularly interested in those as word associations where consciousness failed and there was no association, but the body was reacting wildly. And so what Jung discovered was that the failure of consciousness was precisely the recovery, the recovery of a consciousness that was profoundly embodied as the, again, the embodiment of history and language and meaning, et cetera. So Freud and Jung emerge, for, come in from opposite sides of the mind-body uh, divide, and they both are, 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 become present to and start to talk about the body as no longer the body of anatomy, but the body as a subtle body, or if we it was precisely as the embodiment of language, meaning, and a dynamic cultural history. I think it's quite a bit of interesting sort of bit of, I've never seen that written, I just talk about it. Yeah, but Roger, the way I understand subtle body too, is that the subtle body is where we go when we have visions. I mean, that it is yeah. uh, an experience of out of body in whatever, wherever we are or aren't. <laughs> But it's yeah. an energy that we feel when these, yeah. you know, which which yeah. which yeah. is what makes it special, which is yeah. what tunes us into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think right the, that that part that subtle body is a is an offshoot of where I went. That's right. Let's get back to psyche and place. I want to give folks other folks. You might have your own stories or dreams or associations. Uh, they're really welcome. I'd love to hear, hear yours too. Hi. Is that, is it, who's that? Andy. It is you, Andy. Hi. Yeah. Uh, so 
Yeah, this sense of place. Um, I'm wondering, is it precisely an indigenous perspective? And does it carry across uh, to the indigenous people of this place, for example? Well, that's a great, that's a really interesting question. Do you have your own answer for it? My, my hunch is yes. Yeah. And, and it comes partly from personal experimentation in decolonizing myself. Yeah. And appreciating a sense of place. Yeah. And, and that has to do with opening to all the life forms yeah. that I'm part of and connected to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's right. So I think we see it most clearly when we go into indigenous cultures. But hey, just let's just move around. It, it is given to all of us. It's part of being human. I mean, listen to our accents, you know. I mean, I can hear you're not from... Tennis from Kentucky, the hills of Kentucky. No. Uh, we, I mean, every time I open my mouth, I honor my British colonialist ancestors, whatever I think about them and uh, the shenanigans they got up to. Uh, and everything, you know, whatever I might think of that history, the truth is that I, I carry that history, as I say, every time I open my mouth. And we all do. And, but there is a way in which I think Jung's rather charming essay, Mind and Earth, is a, is a strange way of trying to talk about, Andy, what you've just picked up, which is that there's something about us that does go native whenever we enter a place. I mean, he had this charming idea that the shapes of the, our skulls were different and our walks were different, all sorts of things, once we, once we came to America. But, uh, you know, there's almost a bit of phrenology going on in <laughs> In some of Jung's, the way he's imagining, imagining white Americans in in the in this con continent, but I think you're right. You know, one of the things uh, Mark Sabin said about my work was that one thing he loves about my work is that I assumed that Jung was always right, and I think it's such a funny thing to say, but it he was right when I wrote a lot of the time when I write about Jung. Um, even I, I have the assumption that even when he's wrong, because he's obviously just wrong uh, sometimes, even when he's wrong, he's on to something. And that allows you to read and interpret and so on with a kind of generosity and a humility in relation to his work, which, which I think is appropriate. And, you know, I, I, love, uh, I love reading people assuming that they're right or at least if they're wrong, that they're onto something. You can then go with it and go with it and go with it and push it. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Hi, please. I can't see your name, so you have to just go for it. Hi, Christian. Hi, I just had a story from Scotland, um, which echoes the one you told about the ridge. Um, my great-grandfather bought a house way back in the early 1900s, and he had work done on it. And the workmen would be going back in the gloaming, late in, in, the, in the twilight, um, back to the village after they'd finished their day's work. And at one point, and I forget what exact year it was, but at one point they, they complained because they kept running into all these people who were fleeing and they were strangers and they were in rags and they were troubled and the workmen had no idea who these people were. Wow. And it turned out that they were the soldiers fleeing from the Battle of Flodden, mm. however many hundreds of years before, I think two or 300 years before. Um, and that it, it just was, uh, it was real enough that it was a bother to them. <laughs> um, oh. um, wow. And oddly enough, I mean, I have a friend out in California, in Colorado, and, you know, there was a terrible massacre there of the Native American people called the Sand Hill Massacre. Mm. And at one point they were trying to put a memorial tablet up where it had taken place. And nobody knew exactly where it had taken place. And then they called on one of the elders and he said, oh, I know where it's taken place. I can hear the women crying as they're raped. I can hear the children crying.
crowd screaming as they're killed. So they knew where to place the, Jesus. the memorial marker. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, my mentor when I was in my early 20s was a really remarkable man. He was an Afrikaner, uh, young reporter who was at the Sharpeville massacre trials. And he became a, he became a Dutch reformed priest minister. And then he became a Sufi and a great scholar of religion and of Jung and ended up actually as a minister in a Unitarian church. But he had an extraordinary capacity to be deeply in a place. Um, uh, his, his daughter was a girlfriend I had at the time. I was 21 and she was 19. I mean, we're talking about long, you know, all those years ago. And um, he had an enormous impact on the formation of my life. His daughter told me that he was lying under a tree out on, his, out on the farm uh, and uh, he was asleep and he had a hat over his face and he woke up and there was a bird beating its wings against his hat. And so he moved the hat away to have a look and this bird flew away. And then a moment later, it came flying back and it flapped his wings in his face and was obviously terribly agitated. And he sat up and about 10 feet away in front of him, coming directly towards him was a, a Cape Cobra that is second only to the black mamba in uh, the lethality of its venom. Um, and another, so he had the strain, he was like, St. he often reminded me of the great Sufi and Catholic mystic St. Francis with the animals all around him because he had the strange ability to just be at home in, in, uh, in places. Uh, I know that he was he came, he heard a noise downstairs one night in his house and he went downstairs and a poor terrified intruder was stealing food out of the fridge and and just quite genuinely he said oh you must be hungry let me get you something to eat i mean just anyway he was at a farm in south africa one night when uh, he woke up late at night and there was a british soldier standing at the foot of the bed from the war of 1899 to 1902. And uh, he said, well, listen, you mustn't wake up anybody else. They'll get frightened of you. So you, you just go and sit there quietly for a while. The fellow he'd come in and because it was very cold out, that part of the interior in winter can get down to around zero Fahrenheit. It's bitter. And the following night, he had his whole section there. There were about half a dozen British soldiers standing at the foot of his bed. So he said, listen, don't make a sound. Just come with me. And he made sure his wife didn't wake up. And he took them through to the living room. And he said, what are you doing? And he said, well, I brought my, I brought my squad with me because it's very cold and everybody's cold. And he said, well, listen, you, this is not good. You, you really are dead. And so we need to say the Lord's Prayer. And he said the Lord's Prayer with them and told them that it was time that they, they went to the Father and off they went. And, they, and apparently the house had been haunted for you know, for all those, for deck, for what, nearly a hundred years and, or 70 years at that stage and <laughs> the haunting stopped. <laughs> but that experience of, of the, of being called into that place, it's the only so-called experience of the so-called supernatural that I'm ever aware of having had. Um, it is really a an atypical experience for me, but it was absolutely profound. I mean, it's just... I've lived the last 35 years in relation to that experience. More Hello. stories. Hi. Hi. Um, I, I, I so appreciate all that you've just shared and I feel like it's so much to think about and integrate, but one, one thing that I wanted to share was, um, I love how you referenced, and I can't remember who, but this idea that healing happens, uh, it appears when we're still. And yeah. I think that this way of reframing the psyche is not contained within us, but 
of us being contained within the larger psyche mm-hmm. is such an interesting point of departure and thinking about healing because mm-hmm. in my own experience, I, I go out to the woods and there's a very specific grove of walnut trees and um, I spend a great deal of time drawing them and I'm a visual artist and a printmaker. And so I've created this whole series about going into this, this space. And part of my practice is just going in there and sitting Mm -hmm. and being still. Mm -hmm. And then these encounters start to happen. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like nothing, you know, I'm sitting still and then all of a sudden there's a bird and there's this encounter. Mm -hmm. And so what I've ended up with is this huge series of the same, the same place, but with all the different, what I bring into the place, but what that meeting ground Mm -hmm. of, of, yes, of, of confronting of direct confrontation and openness to the greater ecological community Mm -hmm. that I think is so, so many of us in, in, in this Western culture suffer from that disconnect. So I, I just, I, I really appreciate um, your perspective and, and, I think it has deep implications in. Yeah, I think you've got it. And uh, you described your own example very, just really well. You know, um, about five years ago, I was on sabbatical. The dean told me he wanted to write. He wanted me to write. He said, you need to go to a place where you could write. And I thought, mm, I know just the place. And I went and found a tent in the Kruger National Park. It was a tent on a deck with a fence around and so on. But um and I stayed there for about, uh, oh gosh, I was there for, I don't know, six weeks or something like that, a tent in the, in the wilderness. And at first you feel a bit like a spectator and you see elephant walking by and a hyena used to come by every evening along the fence. And uh, I saw waterback and giraffe and wildebeest and baboons and so on and so on. Um, but after a while, if you allow yourself to drop into it and drop out of this Galilean mindset that the world belongs to physics and biology and natural science. If you drop out of that and allow yourself, as Jung said in East Africa, to allow your psychic forces to pour blissfully back into this primeval expanse, then the elephant, then this little elephant herd with the matriarch and her sisters and the young ones, or the monkeys in the trees, or whatever it is, that all of these are no longer merely animals. They are, they are the presencing of, of a world uh, that carries history and meaning. And you're, you feel much more that you're being visited, and you're being visited by ancestors uh, and the spirits of this place. You know, Ian Player said his own transformative experience with Makubu, where, where, I mean, this was colonial Africa, you know, he was the boss, the white boss, and Makubu was the local guide, but it became a complete role reversal, and Makubu, Mak, sorry, Makubu became his teacher. They were, it was a, it was a boiling hot day at over 110 degrees, and they were dehydrated and thirsty and a long way from anywhere. And they passed a little pile of rocks and Makubu told Ian Player to put a stone on that rock because something sacred had happened there. And Ian Player didn't want to. And Makubu said something in Zulu, the, the equivalent of move your ass, sir. <laughs> and uh, he belligerently threw a stone on the rock. And Makubu said something bad is going to happen. You have insulted the ancestors. And he said they hadn't gone more than a quarter of a mile. And he stood on the tail of a 14 foot black mamba. And this thing, they're arboreal, so they can stand up over six feet tall. And this thing stood up with a, when it's flared its head and neck like a cobra. And the mouth, this black mouth was open. And it was whistling, this sort of whistling tee, 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 sound and this tongue going. And this thing was hovering in front of his face. He said he was like an absolute rabbit. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't blink. He couldn't move as this thing was looking for a place to bite. And uh, he felt as though everything just absolutely froze. 
And it was a long, long time before that snake finally lowered its head and moved off into the bush. And he thought, never again will he disrespect the ancestors or not respect Makubu, who at that moment became his teacher. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Roger. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Alison. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the talk tonight. I hope you had fun with it. Oh, my gosh. So much fun. And then um, your stories and your dreams are deeply touching. I'm actually in tears. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Um, so I, I've, well, I've got a, I don't have like a super profound story, but I did have a, um, a simple dream about the bees since you mentioned the bees. So it's very simple. Just this bee, uh, he is shooting his stings at me kind of in a, in an aggressive way. And I'm like, what's going on? And then he's like, aiming at me and pretty um, precisely. And that's the dream. And then the next morning, um, there is a bee flying into my, my room and he flies out like four times. So that's really interesting. And then I think about it, I'm like, um, I thought about the ancestor things too. So I looked it up in Chinese medicine, I'm Chinese. So in Chinese medicine, like many, many years ago, uh, traditional Chinese medicine, they would say the vernon from the bee sting uh, is uh, medicinal. And they actually, there are acupuncture techniques. They actually use the bee sting to heal people. Um, and then there is like a, there's a Chinese saying, it's like you can cure um, you can cure diseases caused by vernon, by vernon, like an antidote, something like that. So I don't know whether I read my dream correctly, but um, that, that's my little story. Yeah. And, and then your dream about the elephant um, being your soul, that just hit me very... Um, just uh, yeah so you see i'm getting really emotional yeah I, I had a little dream about the elephant too i wondered about it now i think about it i i know that's my th that's about my soul too so thank you so much for sharing tonight uh thank you can i just i gotta show you this i'm gonna share my screen again for a moment Uh, a young bull coming to visit. Can you see it? Uh. <laughs> wow, that's so profound. Now, when, yes. when something like that happens, for me, you know, you, you're not, it really is inadequate to, to just think of it in terms of sort of wildlife, there, there is, uh, this is the presencing of something. Now, you've got to be careful, you know, I mean, there's a wonderful Buddhist story about a Buddha, a, a young Buddhist monk who realized um, that, uh, that everything was of the Buddha nature. Whoops, what's happened? Are you still sharing? I'm not sure still sharing my screen, am I? You I are. Know. We're seeing the PowerPoint um, oh, conclusion. Stop sharing my screen. There we go. Stop share. There we are. Um, there's a story of the, the young monk. He realized that everything was the Buddha nature. And so he's walking along a jungle path and an Indian elephant uh, uh, was coming down the path and he was so happy and he lifted his arms and sort of, hello, Buddha, or whatever it was. And the elephant gave him a big thwack with its trunk and knocked him into the, knocked him off into the into a ditch on the side of the path, 
and he went and complained to his master that uh, the that this elephant had behaved like this. And the master said, "Yeah, but when the when the Buddha comes in the form of an elephant, you must get out of the way." <laughs> so, I mean, you know, I think that to be visited by an elephant like that is is an extraordinary privilege, and. Uh, it has an. It makes its ethical claim upon us. The elephant, the 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 wilderness for me has a face in Levinas's sense, the sense of the face as 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 an other that makes an ethical claim upon us. Um, but uh, but it's also dangerous. I mean, you know, you, you need to be respectful. You don't want to be like those idiots who go off to Yellowstone and decide to put honey on their baby's face so the the nice bear can go and lick the honey off their baby's face. I mean, you know, that's disrespectful, actually. Mm. <laughs> Hi, more. Judy has her hand raised. Judy, please. Hi. I'm just working out where you are and where I am <laughs> in this space. Um, but I, um, I have a story about a bear. And um, we live really as close to the land as we can in Western Massachusetts. We live off the grid and we have wood uh, fired for stoves and wood heat our house with wood. and a big garden and one time I was out in the garden and um, just in the spring watering the garden and a, a bear came across our meadow and stopped and we looked to each other and then the bear carried on and um, my sense was, and you've helped give me words and a frame to what happened, because my sense was, this was the place walking. This was our, or this was the land and the grubs and the berries and the roots and the bees they eat, eat all they're omnivorous they eat all those kinds of things and it had taken the shape of this bear and here it was walking mm. on four legs across mm -hmm. the meadow mm -hmm. yeah yeah it was it was and then it it you know, it, it, the bear went across, continued across, and it um, started raking the logs, some downed trees, you know, looking for ants. And the the privilege for me, the, the pleasure for me was that this bear wasn't um, raiding garbage or um, a bird feeder or something. It was being bear, mm -hmm. <laughs> just itself mm -hmm. and i'm wondering roger when you um when you say we are in psychological space uh, or I, i'm not quite sure what you i think i get what you mean but i'm not quite sure in words what you mean when we are in yeah to say that we're in psychological space is saying the psyche surrounds us. We are inside it. It is not inside us. We, it's just a habit of, it's a, it's a really a modern habit of mind that we have become persuaded that our psychological lives are sort of reducible to brain activity and that it's all going on in our heads. It's not. We are inside it. Uh, we, we've become much more sophisticated, I think, especially in some of our allied disciplines like linguistics, who recognize, you know, we are inside language. Language isn't like a set of, a set of labels that we have in our brains that we sort of hook on the world at appropriate moments and we sort of 
So through the because the world is just the sort of dead stuff until we hook labels on it. Language is all around us. So to say, to say, uh, young society and Massachusetts and Duquesne University and House, these are only possible because they're already ca- carrying language. So la- we are inside language. We're inside. We're inside history. I mean, listen to our accents. Yeah. You know, our, our accents show our accents. I didn't develop my accent from the inside out. Like your bear in the meadow, we we emerge out of our situations. Um, mm. Yeah, we we are constituted. We are not a, 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 an analysis of human being can't start with the person, because the this is how to say it philosophically. An analysis of a human being can't cannot start with the person, because the what we call a person is constituted or derived from human being in the world. So there is a way in which human being in the world is the ground and con- the constitutive ground out of which we are gathered in as Judy and Roger and Andy and Ed and so on, that we, we then emerge as persons, we emerge out of this shared human ground that we call human being in the world. So it's really interesting to to say it, as I said, formally, an analysis of human being can't start with the person because what we call a person is is already derived from human being in the world. In the same way as your bear, your bear isn't self-originating and then finds itself in a meadow. It It is millions and millions of years of meadows out of which the bear has come to be a bear in the way it is a bear. There is a whole ecosystem in which it is embedded. And, you know, we are like that too. So that's sort of pushing your idea further. I hope that was still not, I hope that didn't get become unintelligible. No, no, thank you. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, yeah. So we're in psychological life. I mean, right here, you know, now we, we are, we are gathered here in a history that includes uh, our ancestors, Jung and Freud and, Marie-Louise von Franz and, you know, all, many of those who've come before us and, uh, and in whose tradition we are thinking. Our thoughts are not self-originating, even if we are quite original. They're, they're still drawn out of what, the language and history that is given to us and comes to us. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sarah and Dan have their hands raised. Go ahead, Sarah. Sarah Schwartz, I can't hear you. Mike. Your mic, Sarah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so I have different experiences but the one I want to share that you're sharing tonight has evoked in me is with an insect and it was back in 2007 I was with my husband on Marco Island which is on the Gulf Coast southern part of Florida and we were going back for lunch it was in June and there were not many people on the beach and all of a sudden I saw this insect big hop and then another large hop. It was the largest grasshopper I'd ever seen, maybe five to six inches. And I I talked out loud to it as if I was five years old, just spontaneously. And I said, oh, look at you. Aren't you beautiful? Red and gold, two of the colors of alchemy. And the grasshopper stopped and turned around and looked up at me. And as I continued to just admire it, it stepped onto my shoe and walked up to my knee and my husband standing there watching all of this. And I said, I I mean, it just felt like I was being touched on the edge between the edge of the ocean and the land. It was right on the cusp there. And I said, thank you so much for showing yourself to me. We're on our way to lunch right now. And I don't want to 
hurt your little legs by touching you. Would you mind going back down immediately? This grasshopper I found out later that was called a lubber turned around and walked down and off my shoe. And then I took a picture of it so I could keep it on my refrigerator <laughs> and see him every day. But I felt like St. Francis, like I was in a space out of time and mind um, of a connection that just deeply touched me. And I felt one with that hopper as if I was in the hopper looking up at myself. I don't know how to, you know, how else to describe it, but it was a really wonderful experience. Something that is a, seems to be a uniquely human gift is to be able to bear witness to the beauty of things. As far as we know, all other animals, and I'm excluding whales for a moment because I don't know about them, but, but, but generally speaking, all other animals are, are, all, are, are completely invested in their own perspective. I mean, we are the only beings that can look at a bear or a lion and, and enjoy its majesty, its magnificent beauty. Everything else sees it either as a competitor or as a predator or, no, I mean, there's nothing, that, we're the only ones that can bear witness to beauty, I think. Mm. You know, you ever try taking your dog for a walk and look at a beautiful sunset? Has not, the, not a clue. <laughs> Thank you. The world doesn't know how beautiful it is. And that's for us to know it. I think Jung was right when he describes his the, the meaning of the birth, the, the awakening of consciousness. When he looked out over the plains of East Africa and uh, and thought that the, the, that all, all, all things seek consciousness. And so the human consciousness is that capacity of the earth, which has become conscious. We are that aspect of the earth that has become conscious so that the earth can become conscious of itself. He doesn't quite say it in those words, but that's what he's getting at um, in, in his memories, dreams, reflections. And I, I think that's really, that's always made sense to me that we are the stuff of the earth, but we do have consciousness and the consciousness is not just for ourselves. It's that, is that everything becomes conscious through us. <coughs> Axel, I think you had your hand up, didn't you? Yes. Uh, yeah, I, um, I grew up in, in Germany, and uh, uh, my childhood was spent in a place very much like in the movie set of the movie Frankenstein, where there's a village at the bottom of the hill, and at the top of the hill, there's a castle. And I spent a lot of time at the castle, and... Uh, uh, I think that impacted me because uh, I I, am a, I play lute and I, uh, I I I try to remember myself with the, in the castle whenever I'm playing the lute. So uh, that that's uh, that that's how I uh, that's how the environment impacted me. Mm. If uh, any, uh, uh, I would heartily recommend Lucy Huskinson. She's a wonderful young scholar at the U University of Bangor in Wales. And she's, she's just a wonderful writer with a mind on fire. And uh, she's just written a book on architecture that has apparently been picked up by architects. And it's on, it's, uh, it's on psychology and architecture and so on. It's I recommend anything by Lucy Huskinson. Does anybody know her? Any of you folks know her work? Do you remember Jung's, you remember Jung's dream of the multi-story house and he goes down to the basement and then through the basement doors and the skulls, that's his famous dream where he lied about the contents, uh, the pottery and skulls and the thing. Bachelard wrote a, the, the French phenomenologist and philosopher wrote a, Bachelard wrote an analysis of Jung's dream, but Bachelard inverted it. Uh, he translated basement as attic. 
So Bachelard, in Bachelard's interpretation, the dream is upside down. And Lucy Huskinson wrote an essay where she does an analysis of what happens to Jung's dream and Bachelard's dream when upside, is, upside down is the downside up. And it is an absolute riot of, of just a riotous imagination. I, you know, I recommend Lucy Huskinson for real fun. Hello, Kate. I see you there. Hi, nice to see you. Hmm. <laughs> it's great to see you too. Roger. Yeah, gosh, it's been a long time. Yeah, hi, Erica. Yeah, I love hearing people's stories. I feel like it just brings this whole topic to life, you know. Mm -hmm. More stories. Uh, yeah, I have Thank a you, Alec. Uh, thanks, Axel. Yeah. I have a story. When I was 16, I was with a family drive going across the country to Disneyland. And we got to the, um, the um, uh, Badlands and I was just struck dumb. I couldn't speak. I was just, and I started to cry. And then as we were going over the Rocky Mountains, I just was speechless. I just, something had happened to me. And I went back to Pennsylvania, the Allegheny Mountains, and, and I got really depressed. So I sat out in the dark in my, on the lawn and I stared into the dark, which I was afraid of. And I said, who am I and what am I doing here? And I did that three nights in a row. And the last mm -hmm. night I said, I am not moving the spot until, until you tell me who I am and what I'm doing here. And suddenly there was a shift in my perception and I totally knew who I was and what I was doing here. So that was sort of my first conscious awakening mm. experience. Mm -hmm. And the Badlands started it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Dan? Dan? Yeah. yeah. Dan's got a hand raised. Hi, Dan. Hi. Yeah. Um, so, so I'm don't know how to pull all this together, but I feel like pulling it together is part of what we're talking about in, you know, when you, one thing I thought about was mushrooms that when, you know, we iterate out of the human beingness, just like, like the tops of mushrooms that we see really the mushroom plant is underneath. And, um, and I'm wondering about when you are talking about Jung being able to experience like what that word experience means, there's a certain level of respect there's a certain level of the way that our attention can work where we can start to see that we're inside the psyche rather than outside of it. And um, I guess I, um, you know, I, I had a recent experience where I was, um, people were watching me and I decided that what I was going to talk about was right next to me, but I wasn't going to look at it and I wasn't going to talk to it. I was just going to be next to it and I wasn't going to move. And that kind of, um, it almost sort of simulated how I am with the elephant <laughs> or how I am with this, with the, with the inversion of the psyche and these rivers of emotions started to happen between me and it. And I had this feeling like, it might connect into what I think it was a Judy or second about, you know, or going out into the woods, staying still and having encounters visit me. And that there's a way in which there's maybe, um, maybe something about this attention that we're trying to get has something to do with respect and being aware yet not moving in some way. I don't, I'm not quite sure. And, yeah. and I just wanted to say that like, when you talk about, place as being space and time and then how of course there's the space time continuum and then there's gravity and gravity curves space and time and it seems so i'm just wondering about how um like the earth is a place of gravity and when we pay attention in a certain way we create moments of gravity like we curve and we, and we bring time into space. I, I'm just using other language with what you're saying. Um, and that from that place of, you know, spending enough time 
Like when we spend just enough time with something that it becomes a place, when we have an encounter, that that creates that, um, I don't know, I think of a curvature or an amphitheater from which things can be entertained and seen. Um, I, 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 sorry if I've gone too far. Oh, that's fine. But, yeah. You know, I'm sure you know there's a lot of work that uh, some people have done on uh, the implicate order and trying to use some yeah. of the some of that work in sort of uh, systemic physics, systems theory and physics and and so on, uh, uh, sort of foundational. Uh, my thought is, if that works for you, that's fine. I I think that there are I have problems with it uh, conceptually. I, I'll only say I'm not. I, I don't feel I can evaluate whether it's right or wrong or true enough or anything. It, if it works for you, that's fine. What I would I would only say is that what I was talking about was in a way more ordinary, that we tend to think of space as geometric space. But when when it has a name, Pittsburgh, named after William Pitt in Pennsylvania, uh, you know, and on and on and on, um, that, that here we are in the, the space. As soon as we, uh, places have names even, then they intersect, then space intersects or, or gathers history and becomes place. So I really mean it in a fairly ordinary, uh, very concrete, down-to-earth way. Um, uh, for me, going into sort of space-time continuums and curves and things like that, oddly enough, for me, it takes me out of what I'm talking about, uh, which is very just immediately embedded. But if it works for you, hey, enjoy. Think it further. Imagine it further. Because... Who knows where it'll take you? You have an adventure. I want to go to Kate. She's got a hand up. Mm, yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to share something quick that uh, I think fits fits in with all this. And I'm sorry I came in late because I was on the road, but uh, so I missed the very beginning. I missed your your elephant story, which I will hear from Ed. But um, I had an experience where. Um, I was doing some training in indigenous uh, spirituality and uh, a woman who was part of the group came to my house one day and, and she gave me uh, an eagle feather that someone had given to her, but she just knew it wasn't really, she wasn't supposed to be the one to have it, but she felt very strongly that I was. So she gave me this eagle feather and I also didn't really know if it would, if it, if it was mine or if I should carry it either, or maybe I should pass it on. I just, I wasn't really clear how I, if, if this was right. And so um, I was sort of sitting with that and about a week later, now I didn't ask for this, but about a week later I had a dream and it was very unlike any of the other dreams that I'm used to having. It was very concrete. And I was standing in the middle of a field all by myself and it was kind of cloudy. And I, I looked up, and an eagle flew by and a feather came right down to me. Uh, yeah. And there was no question after that. I just knew that that was, you know, that was meant for me. So I, I really appreciate all the, all the stories. because where, uh, where do you have it? Where do you have that feather now? Oh, it's in my office. In it's wrapped office. up though. Yeah. It's not actually legal to have one, but oh. yeah. But so yeah, it's wrapped up in, in bed cloth in my office. I also wanted to take note that there's a beautiful spider right now, right here on my coffee table. And um, it's not, a, not the kind of spider I've ever seen before. Oh, maybe it's gone away now. Anyway, it was here, it was here all the time we were talking. Uh -huh. So we'll have to think about that. Who's, who's next to Ed there with the, the black and the glasses? Hi, my, my name is Bob Wiener, a friend of Erica's. Hi, Erica. Hi, Bob. Can you hear me? I, yes. I just got this microphone, and <laughs> I hope it helps. Thank you, Roger. Um, really fertile, fertile, fertile material. Um, I've been a musician my whole life, and what I'm thinking about is certain venues that I grew up as a different stages of my experience, like the Fillmore East in New York City was a, a rock and roll haven that we as teenagers 
kind of came of age in. So I might posit that it was a, a kind of a sacred space or the Village Vanguard in New York City was a jazz place that had a certain numinosity to it. Um, and then it changes. You go back to those venues or they leave or they... So this idea of like stage as sacred space or even as a place where the psyche recognizes, oh, I can relax here or I can, I can imagine here or I can do this. And people that make stages who might understand this, what you're talking about, um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that or if people have looked into this. Because I think what happens in the music world is we study the information. So people go to jazz programs and they're like, oh, Charlie Parker played this. And Charlie Parker was, I would say, an ecstatic. You know, he was a mystic. Miles Davis, Eric and I discuss this a lot. John Coltrane, these, these people were mystics. They were channeling. They were in these other you know, states of consciousness. Um, and, then, and then we study them and we're like, well, this is what they played and this is what they did. But that's not perhaps the energy that is informing the experience. So you're making me think about place also. Like Alice Coltrane created a church in the Bay Area where her, that's, that's where she wanted to be physically to do what she could do. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about stages. I just love your, uh, your, your example, and I think you're obviously right. I mean, in something that we all have experienced probably is the psychotherapeutic space. Imagine, try, try, imagine going into a, therap into a therapist's office or inviting your patient into your office and just leaving the door wide open. You, you, it's hard to know how you could even begin. Or if, the, if you had a television in your office and it was on. I mean, there is a, the, the aesthetics of the office are the, the constitution of, you know, of a sacred space, of a very, a very special kind of place. It is a sacred space. Sometimes it's a sp sacred space that is different from the sacred space of a church. So, mm. I mean, we can, we, can talk about, we can talk about things and have all sorts of experiences that might, are not that holy. <laughs> <laughs> at least I did <laughs> you know yeah yeah what, what does holy mean Roger you know well, holy is in the bot in the I just, I just meant it in the I meant it in the ordinary sense of the sort of we talk about things that we don't normally talk about in church mm. <laughs> yeah. Ed you had your hand up too yes you? thank you again Raj uh, and everybody all the stories are wonderful yeah I well I'm choosing one story of many that I could share. But first, uh, to Bob, I don't know if you know it or if you have, but I do recommend you uh, investigate the Greek god Dionysus, who was the god of theater. And theater was oh. sacred space. And yes. originally, every performance was uh, a sacred ritual. Yes. So, Excellent. yes. And uh, the wonderful musicians that you referenced knew that and lived that, but they didn't use that language. So thank you for bringing that up. Right. Uh, I, I, I have a big story uh, about how this works in other cultures. Um, uh, a few of you know that, uh, well, Kate and I have been working with uh, our military and veterans for decades. And for 20 years, I've been uh, leading healing and reconciliation journeys back to Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese hear, uh, there are thousands of these reports of the Vietnamese hearing the, the crying, the wailing, the agony of their dead from the war deep in the jungles. And there is a, a, there are tr there is a practice of traditional shamanism in Vietnam where families who have missing will contact a shaman they hear the wailing and the shaman listens to the wailing or goes into trance to call that soul to them. Scouts honor, uh, I've worked and interviewed um, 
the, uh, the shamanic network in Vietnam, and I've observed these ceremonies. There have been over 10,000 locations of MIA remains from investigating the whaling in the jungles and finding the families who are uh, the conduit for that, for the soul of that, their missing in action to come back and talk to the shaman and tell them where to find the body. So th this is what you're sharing in a very living, livid, uh, present way. A little more. Uh, when we take our people back to Vietnam, we become very deeply involved in the countryside. We go to places that uh, Westerners have never been sometimes. The Vietnamese have a, a, an unusual verb that they, we translate as windshielding. Most veteran groups that go back to Vietnam stay in their group. They stay in their tour bus. The Vietnamese wonder, why are you windshielding? You're not here with us. It's as if they're traveling in their Western consciousness and as if their tour bus is their defense system and they aren't not only entering the culture, but I love what you're sharing and saying they're, uh, the, the psyche of Vietnam is open and welcoming to us just as you experienced in the African bush and only a few Westerners are leaving th that Western frame and entering deeply into the psyche that in fact is available to us. And we see that the veterans that stay in their groups and on the bus, uh, they get some degree of peace and reconciliation seeing the Vietnam is green and moving on again, but not very much healing. Whereas the, the veterans who come back with us and enter the psyche of Vietnam and are welcomed there in dreams, in experiences like this, and by the Vietnamese people welcoming them and saying, you've come back, you're bringing our ancestors back to us. You are our brother and sister because of the experience that we shared. Those are the ones that have transformative healing and come back uh, with, without PTSD. But the ones who travel staying contained and don't enter the larger psyche still come back with their wounds. You know, what you're saying, it reminds me of Jung's comment uh, of looking at the Europeans in India. He said, most of the Europeans here uh, do not live in India. They live in a sort of bottle full of European air. Because uh, the Indians live a, live a reality that the Europeans can only dream, which again, I think is very, I think is actually quite profound. But we are nearly at time, so I want to just uh, see where does our ho where are our hosts taking us? Should I thank you all and just say thank you so much for sharing this evening with me? And uh, gosh, this has been fun to meet meet some of you and hear you. And God bless, it was really really fun. I hope uh, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you, Roger. Thank and you very much. Thanks again, Ed and Kate and Erica for the invitation and. Uh, Elric, thanks so much. Andy, thanks for your help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Yeah. Great Thank to you. see you. Thank you. Great to see everybody. Wonderful to be with you again, Roger. Nice to be with you, too. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. I look forward to chatting soon. We must, we must get, we must keep in touch. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, before you disappear into the bush for another six months. <laughs>